Welcome to a very normal therapeutics employee training video. In this video, we'll talk about the properties of the normal distribution. We'll talk about what they are, why they're important, and we'll use a little bit of code along the way. At the end, I'll show you how to connect the relevant concepts so that you have a more solid foundation in statistics. If you're a new employee, my name's Christian, and I'm a PhD student in biostatistics. The goal of this channel is to make statistics easier to understand so that others can better apply it to their daily lives to stay informed. In the employee training video for parametric families, I briefly talked about the normal distribution. In that video, I only talked about how we interpret the parameters of the normal and the effect they have on the shape of the probability distribution. But there's so much more to the normal distribution that lays at the core of introductory statistics, especially hypothesis testing. This is why the training videos have been so slow to get to this topic. Even though it's portrayed as an introductory topic, there's so much background that you need to understand it before you can really get it. Sometimes I think it's weird that we even call the normal distribution normal because it has so many special properties. So much so that I've decided to dedicate an entire video to talking about what these properties are. The normal distribution is everywhere in statistics, so we need to be comfortable working with them. Let's get started. Many of the special properties of the normal distribution have to do with transformations of normals. A transformation is nothing more than a function, and a transformation of a random variable is still a random variable. In general, the transformation will not be the same type of random variable as the original input. We might be able to figure out its probability distribution using math, but it's unlikely that it'll come from one of the common distributions. But the normal distribution is different. Let's say that x is just a normal random variable with a mean mu and a variance sigma squared. And let's say that I have two numbers, a and b. The values of these numbers don't matter, we just need two distinct values. Now let's define our first transformation, y1. The transformation will be x plus a. Depending on what a is, it will just shift the entire distribution by this value. y1 is still a normal variable, but now its mean is just mu plus a. Let's say that y2 is another transformation, which we'll define as x times b, a multiplication instead of an addition. Scaling x by b has the effect of changing the original variance. When a normal variable is multiplied by a number, the resulting transformation is still normal. The mean is still the same, but the variance is multiplied by the square of b, not just b. Adding values to normals changes the mean, while multiplying values changes the variance. For any number a and positive number b, the resulting transformation is still a normal random variable. The normal distribution is what's called a location scale family. That is, linear combinations of normal random variables are still normal. The normal distribution is not the only parametric family to have this property, but it's still important that it has it. The location scale property is important because it lets us represent all normal random variables in terms of a so-called standard normal variable, which has zero mean and unit variance. For reasons unknown to me, we usually denote a standard normal as z. To get back to any arbitrary normal, we just need to set a equal to its mean and b equal to its standard deviation. Conversely, we can convert any normal random variable back into a standard one by doing the reverse process. This is called standardization. In ancient times, undergraduate students were forced to read probabilities from a z-score table. These tables were useful at the time because we could just characterize a single distribution in a table instead of having to deal with infinitely many normal random variables. But nowadays, we can just do this with R or Python. We will get into it with this training video, but take some time to internalize the form of the equation of the standardized normal random variable. You'll be seeing a lot of it in the future. Let's take it up a notch with the transformations. Let's say that x1 is a normal with its own mean and variance, and x2 is another normal with its own mean and variance. Furthermore, x1 and x2 are independent, meaning that the value of one doesn't affect the value that another might take. The question is, what will happen when we consider a transformation that adds these two random variables? If you've seen the parametric families video, then you've actually encountered sums of variables before. The binomial distribution is actually just a sum of Bernoulli random variables. This is a case where sums of a random variable actually turn out to be another common random variable. This does not usually happen. But when it comes to the normal distribution, it's even simpler than the binomial example. When we add two independent normals, the ending result is still normal, and that's so convenient. To get the new mean of the sum, we just need to add the means of the ingredient normals. To get the variance, it's the same thing. We just need to sum the variances. This property is referred to as stability. 
linear combinations of normal random variables remain as normal. This comes up again when we consider two sample t-tests. Rather than deal with two different normal distributions, we can just subtract one from the other and turn it into a single normal. The location scale and stability properties are not unique to the normal distribution, but this third property is. To appreciate it, we need to put up some equations. After we collect data, we can create estimators for both the mean and variance. Just by looking at the equations, would you say that the sample mean and sample variance are dependent on each other? I mean, the sample mean is right here in the variance equation, so intuitively, they should depend on each other, right? While this is true for most other distributions, it's actually not for the normal. If the data comes from a normal distribution, then these two estimators are independent. Proving this is the character building exercise for statistics students, and we won't discuss it in this video. This independence is significant because it's necessary for constructing the famous t-distribution, which will take center stage when we talk about t-test. Why is statistics so obsessed with the normal distribution? One way Bell distributions arise in life is through products of small numbers. Another reason is that sums of random variables are common seen and used in statistics. You can most easily see this in one of these. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that word, so I'm just going to call it a Plinko board. If a ball hits a nail, it can go either left or right and then drop down a level. As the ball gets farther down the board, it accumulates a bunch of left and right decisions. Once the ball hits the floor, its location is the result of the sum of all of these decisions. Repeating this with many, many balls will yield that familiar bell shape. The link between sums and the normal distribution can also be seen in the famous central limit theorem. You can't see it directly, but the sum is hidden here in the sample mean. Before we can look at the result, let's talk about what we need to assume for this theorem to work out. To construct the sample mean, we need observations that are independent and identically distributed. This is often named in shorthand as IID data. Independent refers to the fact that if one of these variables takes a certain value, it does not influence the probability distribution of the others. Identically distributed means that they should all be generated from the same probability distribution. For example, they might all come from the same Bernoulli distribution and have the same probability of success. The assumptions of CLT are assumptions on this data. First, the population mean, also known as the expectation, of these variables needs to be some number. It can't be infinite or undefined, or else that's a problem. It may sound weird for a random variable to have an undefined mean, but these types of monsters definitely exist. Second, the population variance of the individual data points also needs to be finite. That's because, like with the population mean, certain random variables may have an infinite or undefined variance. Usually we denote the population mean and variance as mu and sigma squared. This can be confusing because you might think that the data come from a normal distribution, but this is not an assumption the central limit theorem makes. For most random variables, we can define a population mean and variance. In some places, you'll see the population mean denoted as this, and you'll see the population variance denoted as this, but other times you'll see it denoted as mu and sigma squared. Now that the assumptions are out of the way, let's look at the theorem itself. The left-hand side doesn't have just the sample mean, it's a transformation of the sample mean. Specifically, the population mean is being subtracted from it first, and then this difference is being multiplied by square root n. On the right-hand side, there's a normal distribution. Its mean is at zero, and its variance is actually the population variance we discussed earlier. Notice that there's no dependence on the sample size here. The last element is this arrow with the d hovering over it. We would read this as converges in distribution, and in this case, converges as the sample size grows to infinity. Because of this, we refer to the central limit theorem as an asymptotic result. An asymptote represents a value that a function will approach as it goes off to infinity. It won't ever touch it, but it'll get close. In that same spirit, this normal distribution on the right represents the distribution that will approach for this transformation as we gather infinitely many data. Assuming that all of the assumptions of CLT are correct, thanks to the location scale property, we can isolate the sample mean, and the normal on the other side would still keep its normality. Thus, under CLT conditions, the sample mean has a sampling distribution centered at the population mean, with the variance that shrinks with the growing sample size. Strictly speaking, we must always respect that this only happens as n goes to infinity. So you might hear this in other places as being referred to as an asymptotic normal, denoted like this. 
Taking another step forward, we can standardize this. This means that the right-hand side will become a standard normal, and the left-hand side will look like this. You might recognize this form if you've taken statistics classes before, and now you know why it takes this particular form. In practical settings, we normally don't have the time to collect infinite amounts of data. Ain't nobody got time for that! Instead, we often just try to get a large enough sample size and make another assumption that whatever sample size we have is large enough for asymptotics to kick in. This means that even though the sample size is finite, it's large enough for the sampling distribution to be approximately normal. For some reason, 30 is thrown out there as a good enough sample size. You know, you know, because um, you did statistics and, and science, um, statistical analysis, you need 30 samples uh, as like a, the basics of statistical significance. Uh and I'm still trying to figure out how that rule of thumb was born. This might seem ridiculous, but it's a practical reality that has to be faced. A good statistician will keep this assumption in mind and try to evaluate what will happen when these assumptions are actually wrong. You just can't get away from it. For our code demonstration, we'll prove to ourselves that it actually doesn't matter how the data itself is distributed and that the distribution of the sample mean will be approximately normal. To do this, I've written the following code. The central limit theorem requires that a lot of data is used. So I'll set a sample size of 100 for all the sample means I create. I'll assume that 100 data points is enough for asymptotics to kick in. Then I need to actually simulate the data. So I'll use the rUnit function to generate a data set of 100 independent and identically distributed observations from a standard uniform distribution. Then we'll calculate the sample mean. I need the distribution of the sample mean, so I'll do this many, many times. Now that I have a collection of sample means, I'll compare it to the appropriate normal that it's supposed to converge to. We can see that sample means of uniforms produce the normal distribution. What if the data was binomial? Same thing. Poisson? Same thing. Central limit theorem does not care about the law of the data itself. As a final example, I'll generate data from an unknown but devious distribution. Let's see what happens here when we watch the distribution evolve. Something goes wrong here and we don't get the nice convergence to the normal. If you have an idea why this happens and what distribution I'm simulating from, let me know in the comments. If you'd like to work with this code yourself, I put a GitHub link in the description. As always, let's link everything back together in a schema. Despite its name, the normal distribution has several properties that make it special. There are a lot of these, but we touched on three in particular. It's a location scale family, it's a stable distribution, and the sample mean and sample variance are independent if the data is normally distributed. The location scale property means that linear combinations of normal are still normal. This is important because we can convert all normals back to a standard normal, which we know a lot about. This is similar to the stability property. Stability tells us that linear combinations of normals are still normal. This is relevant to two sample tests, where we can convert normal distributions coming from two populations into a single distribution. In general, we can estimate the sample mean and sample variance with these equations. Usually, these estimators are dependent on each other, but in the case of the normal, they're actually independent. This is important for constructing the t-distribution, which will come up with t-tests. The normal is common in statistics because sums and products are common, and the central limit theorem is a clear example of this. The central limit theorem is an example of an asymptotic theorem because the normal distribution is the limiting distribution. For the central limit theorem to work, we need to assume that the variance and expectation are finite and assume the data is independent and identically distributed. The central limit theorem implies that the sample mean has an asymptotically normal distribution no matter how the original data is distributed. Often we just try to get a large enough sample size where the distribution is approximately normal. Before you go, consider subscribing to the company newsletter to keep updated with employee holidays, videos, and extra content. I'll see you in the next one.